John Hume, one of the architects of the Northern Ireland peace process, has died at the age of 83. Tributes are paid to the man who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize after a life devoted to bringing peace by making himself heard. You, you shot the, them with rubber bullets and gas. The crowd was marching over there. The leaders were going to speak to you. Before we even got there, you opened fire. We'll be looking... Got lockdown fuzz. Yes, I'm more than most. <laughs> then, if that wasn't enough to whet your appetite, we'll also revisit some iconic moments from the last 35 years. Hope you all enjoyed the fireworks. <laughs> Good night. See you on the square this summer. This is BBC One for London and the South East. Now, the one o'clock news with Simon McCoy and Natalie Graham. John Hume, one of the architects of the Northern Ireland peace process, has died at the age of 83. Tributes are paid to the man who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize after a life devoted to bringing peace by making himself heard. You shot them with rubber bullets and gas. The crowd was marching over there. The leaders were going to speak to you. Before we even got there, you opened fire. We'll be looking back on the life of a man who dedicated his political life to finding peace in Northern Ireland. Also this lunchtime, bridge over Genoa killed 43 people. Italians prepare to open its replacement. In London and the South East, our theatres face losing tens of millions of pounds this year as pantomimes are cancelled. And more than a year after a trainee paramedic took his own life, the London Ambulance Service say they've learned from the past. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. John Hume, one of the architects of the peace process in Northern Ireland, has died at the age of 83. The former FOIL MP and co-founder of the SDLP received the Nobel Prize for his part in forging the Good Friday Peace Agreement in Northern Ireland. Among those paying tribute, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who called him a political giant totally opposed to violence. Tony Blair described Mr Hume as a political titan, a visionary, he said, who refused to believe the future had to be the same as the past. Our Ireland correspondent Chris Page looks back at his life. You, you shot the, them with rubber bullets and gas. The crowd was marching over there. The leaders were going to speak to you. Before we even got there, you opened fire. John Hume stood against violence for all of his life, but he was never far from confrontation. He took on the army, the police and the IRA, in his quest for a fair and peaceful Northern Ireland. There is not a single injustice in Northern Ireland today that justifies the taking of a single human life. If I were to lead a civil rights campaign in Northern Ireland today, the major target of that campaign would be the IRA. Against what they have done. Originally, he hadn't intended to be a politician. Mr Hume trained for the priesthood and then became a teacher. But his social conscience led him to campaign for housing and employment rights for Catholics in the 1960s. After the troubles broke out, he and several others founded a new nationalist political force, the Social Democratic and Labour Party. As SDLP leader, Mr Hume forged links around the world with the aim of ending the conflict at home. And the SDLP have failed to do that. Sorry, Jim. well, uh, that's a very fundamental well, point. Uh, In the late 1980s, he began talks with the Sinn Féin leader, Gerry Adams. Having a dialogue with the political wing of the IRA was a huge risk and drew much angry criticism. But Mr Hume helped to persuade Republicans to call a ceasefire. The pathway he carved out led to the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Today we can take a collective breath and begin to blow away, let's hope, the cobwebs of the past. Is give peace a the peace deal was a defining moment for Northern Ireland and for John Hume. He was lauded as a visionary and hailed as a hero by pop stars and by presidents. Mr. President and Mrs. Clinton, as you can see from the people of Derry, you are very, very welcome here today. After he was awarded the Nobel Prize, Mr Hume maintained his international friendships and statesmanlike reputation. 
but he gradually stepped down from his elected rules at Stormont Westminster in Brussels as his health declined. In his later years, he was always greeted with admiration when he appeared at events in his home city of Derry. Perhaps more than anyone else, John Hume was recognised as the father of the peace process. The Nobel Peace Prize winner and former SDLP leader John Hume, who's died at the age of 83. Well, tributes have been pouring in from figures across the political spectrum. The Irish Taoiseach, Micheál Martin, said it is impossible to properly express the scale and significance of John Hume's life. He was one of the towering figures of Irish public life of the last century. His vision and tenacity saved this country. Let's go to Belfast. Our Ireland correspondent Emma Vardy is there. His legacy very much is going to be his role in, in that peace process. Of course. I mean, here he is seen as a hero of the Northern Ireland peace process, always a continual advocate of peace. He was someone who hated the violence of the IRA and he was always spelling out his belief that democracy and negotiation should be the alternative uh, to bombs and bullets. So, of course, today tributes have poured in, tributes to him as a, a visionary and tributes for his great belief during some of the darkest days and his ability to overcome some of the uh, deepest divisions here in Northern Ireland and sometimes that was at great personal risk to himself. When he entered into those secret negotiations with Sinn Féin, then the political wing of the IRA, there was great opposition in unionist communities but it was those delicate talks behind the scenes that helped pave the way for a ceasefire. And the former US President Bill Clinton once referred to John Hume as the Nelson Mandela of Northern Ireland. Now, of course, in later years, his health had been deteriorating and it was this morning at his nursing home in Derry when his family released a statement to say that, sadly, he had passed away. Now, the former leader of Sinn Féin, Gerry Adams, has expressed a deep sense of personal loss at his death. But his current leader, Mary Lou MacDonald, she said he was a towering figure and a national icon. And Boris Johnson has said that his passing is a reminder of just how far Northern Ireland has come. So, of course, he will be remembered very affectionately here today as a visionary of Northern Ireland. Many people believing that without him, the Northern Ireland peace process just couldn't have happened in the same way. Emma, thank you very much. Emma Vardy. Lunchtime. John Hume, one of the architects of the Northern Ireland peace process, has died at the age of 83. And still to come, more trouble on the high street as the gym and sports retailer DW Sports goes into administration. There are reports of panic buying of essentials. A state of disaster gives the police and emergency services broader powers to enforce restrictions. Australia did have early success in suppressing the virus, but the outbreaks in Victoria are worse than ever. Two years ago, the city of Genoa was struck by tragedy when its iconic Morandi Bridge collapsed, killing 43 people. As the city prepares to inaugurate its replacement, services have been held to remember those who died. An investigation into the cause of the disaster is due to conclude shortly, with a trial expected next year. Mark Lowen reports. Rising up from tragedy, a new symbol of Genoa. Sleek and efficient, designed, they say, to last a thousand years. 2018, a corroded cable stay on the old Morandi Bridge breaks, tearing down a 200 meter long section. 43 people crushed by the icon of their city in one of the worst infrastructure disasters in modern Italian history. Bridges maintenance company and successive governments stand accused of years of neglect, despite warnings the steel was corroding. It would simply become possible when you have a tragedy. A hole in the heart of this city has been filled, but it will take time to heal. Mark Lowe in BBC News, Genoa. Time for a look at the weather. Let's go to Louise Lear. Louise. Northwest. Sign. Louis. Oh, sorry, Louise, thank you very much. That's all from us. Now it's time for the news where you are. From me, good afternoon. The headlines in London and the South East. My pantomimes could be cancelled this Christmas. Without Panto, the industry really is going to struggle to survive. It's really important. Good afternoon. Many theatres across London and the South East are considering cancelling or postponing their Christmas pantomimes, which provide a significant amount of their annual revenue. Pantos generate more than £60 million every year at the box office. The latest figures suggest they sell almost 3 million tickets each winter.
On average, theatres are 76% full for a panto performance. Well, today, the UK's biggest pantomime producer, Qdos, has announced it's begun consulting theatres about this year's season. Our reporter, Sarah Smith, is at the Stag Theatre in Seven Oaks for us this lunchtime. So what more do we know, Sarah? Well, this is hugely worrying news for theatres across the country. QDOS produce more than 80 pantos every year at the Palladium, Dartford, Bromley, Hastings. And now they say they're having to look at whether these can go ahead. They say the government, they told the government they needed to know by today what the guidelines would be. But they've been told they won't know until November at the earliest. Now, here in Seven Oaks, their pantomime is produced by a small independent group and they're bucking that trend. They are going ahead. And the producer explained to me why panto is so important. This pandemic has actually made people realise that pantomime pays for the rest of the year. Pantomime feeds into the industry, so the young performers who get their first break, their first job in panto, then go on to do other things. They wouldn't have been discovered if it wasn't for pantomime. For audiences, we all know that kids go to panto first and then they become theatre goers for life. So the, the audiences of the National Theatre, of the Globe, of the West End, they start in a little auditorium like this seeing a pantomime. And without panto, the industry really is going to struggle to survive. It's really important. Well, to make it work here, they're having a much smaller cast and crew and the cast are going to have to cancel their own Christmases so that they can go into a bubble together. The audiences will be smaller, they'll have shorter shows, but they'll have four every day. It is a financial risk because even then everything could close, but they say it's a risk they have to take because Panto is so important to theatres across the country. Sarah, thank you. Just over a year ago, trainee... Great. Something to look forward to. <laughs> Nina, thank you very much indeed. That's all from us this lunchtime. We'll be back at 6.30 here in the South East. Bye-bye for now.